Hello, everyone, and welcome to our third webinar, Artificial Intelligence and Law. I am Aus Haider, Law and Data Science Researcher at Brightlands Institute for Smart Society. During this webinar, I will take the role of the moderator. Due to the high number of participants, we have decided to organize this third webinar so we can record it and send it to the registrants who couldn't attend. And now let's take a look at our program for today. We have five minutes introduction, 40 minutes presentation, and 15 minutes for your uh, questions. Before we start, a couple of house rules. Please write your questions in the Q&A section and not in the chat section for following the questions easily. Asking questions can be at any moment during the webinar. We will do our best to answer all the questions. Please, no raising hands. And now allow me to introduce you to our guest for today, Professor Gijs van Dijk, Professor of Private Law at Maastricht University, Principal Investigator at Brightlands Institute for Smart Society and Coordinator of Law and Tech Lab at Maastricht University. Professor van Dijk is going to tell us whether we all are going to lose our jobs for AI. Is that true, Professor van Dijk, or the situation is different? The floor is yours. Yeah, thanks a lot, Aus. Uh, let me just uh, share my screen here. Okay, I think this should be the one. Yeah, there we go. Okay, so thanks a lot, Aus, for uh, for this uh, invitation and the possibility to do this uh, this webinar. Um, so indeed, I'm a professor of uh, law at uh, Maastricht University, uh, one of the directors of the Maastricht Law and Tech Lab, and also one of the principal investigators at the Brightlands Institute for Smart Society, which hosts this, uh, this webinar. Um, so before I start with the, the content, I would um, kindly also um, introduce a, a bit a little bit more. So we're an interdisciplinary uh, group of um, uh, uh, investigators coming from different faculties. Uh, we try to connect to uh, practice by um, uh, having an or an, a platform that's um, a valorization platform uh, where our companies, organizations, etc., can come to, and also a platform where we can bring the things that we develop at the university to society. So in addition to the investigators that we see here, there's, there's also other researchers, and ours is, uh, is one of them. So I have a, a, a th at least three focal points. Uh, one is on privacy preserving techniques. So I'll explain a little bit about that uh, more detail later in this presentation. Value creation from data and also very importantly, the human machine interaction uh, to make sure that, the, uh, that what we implement from a technical perspective is, is also ethical and, uh, and legal. Do this with uh, with a lot of other organizations and, and companies, and uh, most of them are uh, are here mentioned on the slide. Uh, and here's some examples. So one project we try to stimulate and um, uh, ensure that we comply with legal standards and ethical standards when we share data across the, the borders. Um, there's uh, uh, projects where uh, police officers wear glasses, uh, where they can see information and otherwise on devices. Uh, can interact with, uh, with uh, information that's stored digitally. Uh, a little bit more closer to the topic that I'm going to talk about, regulatory technology. We have a project where we try to connect the legislative changes that take place to the organization and the organizational structure so that when there's any change in legislation or there's a new law or a reform that we know automatically which organization parts are going to be affected by this. Okay, so going to the and transitioning to the, the topic of today, the role of law of AI and law, I'm going to kind of start from the from the other perspective that we're not going to try to stimulate it, but try to stop. And then these developments developments have actually taken place. So um, in France, a few years ago, there was um, a ban introduced for analyzing um, uh, information that includes the names of, uh, of judges 
uh, and could lead to the ident identification of, of judges. What was the story here? There was a researcher who um, was interested in the question whether courts deal differently in France with respect to migration cases. Um, and he actually found differences between courts. So that means that as a, uh, as a migrant, you're better off in some courts or with some judges compared to others. Uh, the story goes that the researcher sent the PDF to the Judiciary Council, that the Judiciary Council couldn't open it, and then the researcher decided to publish the study. Um, and uh, yeah, from there, uh, a lot of things happened and it ultimately led to, uh, to a ban which can lead to uh, five years of imprisonment. So here I have the, um, uh, the article that's applicable. Uh, also in, uh, in Germany, there's a, a similar development that, that was going on. Um, here we had Kluwer offering uh, legal uh, services and uh, the, the bar in Germany of lawyers uh, objected to that. And the claim was that it's, that it's exclusively uh, for, the, um, for the lawyers and for the bar to provide these legal services and not to uh, unauthorized parties such as, uh, such as Kluwer. Um, there are cases where the, the Bar Association actually was uh, granted their complaint so that it was not allowed for Kluwer to, to offer these, uh, these services. In the meantime, or after, after this case, there is also some other cases that provide uh, a, a different outcome or more nuance too. But it, it kind of shows that, that you know, there's stuff going on and it's not always going that, uh, that great. Um, so we can try to stop it. Um, but let's look mostly at the, at the potential and also at the limitations of artificial intelligence when we try to apply it to law. And I'll start with the question, do we need humans and will we need uh, humans? Or indeed, uh, as, as it was introduced in the beginning by the announcer Aus, um, will AI replace humans? And I think the, the answer is no. And in order to kind of substantiate that, I would like to point to the video assisted referee, which obviously is not AI, but it is technology. And the idea was by introducing technology, cameras on the field and um, uh, people assessing the, the decisions by, made by the referee on the field, then you can get fair outcomes where um, you know, one goal, if, if one goal is, is, uh, is annulled, or a goal is allowed, whether it shouldn't have been allowed, then it can cost millions for, for clubs. So the introduction of more cameras in this technology was supposed to, um, to help the, the referee. Now, you can say a lot of things about whether it works or not, or whether it, it does produce fair outcomes or not. What I want you to point at is, is basically the picture on the bottom right of, uh, of your screen. Because uh, the, the idea that because of the introduction of technology, people are going to be replaced uh, proves wrong, at least in this example. In fact, whereas in the past, before the VAR or video assessed referee, we only had uh, a referee on the field and ten, two uh, referees on the side and then a fourth official. And um, now all of a sudden, you know, look at, look at how many people there are behind the screen. There's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And okay, like in most, uh, most countries, it's a little bit less than eight folks, but it goes to show that, that the introduction of technology uh, might not necessarily reduce or replace humans, but it can actually increase the activities uh, that we do. And it definitely changes the interaction and the role of the referee on the, uh, on the field. So what we can do is, is kind of try to transfer, um, and that's one of the roles that, that AI and technology can have, transfer the human expertise to, uh, to machines so that we kind of teach machines what we want the decisions to be. And we see that in, in other sports. So for example, tennis, there's this rule of when the ball hits the line, it's in, if it's outside of the line, it's out. And that rule, we can actually outsource to machines who can help us determine, make those decisions. So we instruct machines uh, regarding making these decisions. And we see like these types of activities in, in a lot of sports. Uh, and I, I mentioned a few here, but there's, uh, there's way more. So this is like a very simple idea of we try to transfer the knowledge that is in humans and we try to outsource those rules to machines. It also is happening in law. So there's a lot of legal bots, for example, on 
parking tickets. You can object to parking tickets and you can interact with, with a bot here to find out what your legal position is or what you can do about it. Uh, same thing for visa even. So if you're an immigrant and wanna find out uh, information about obtaining a visa, you can now start interacting with these bots that help you providing that, uh, that information. Uh, same thing goes for privacy and there's, there's lots of other examples out there where you can basically um, interact with these, uh, with these machines. And these are all examples of humans transferring their knowledge and formalizing their knowledge uh, and turning that knowledge then into something that you can actually interact with as a user. A little bit more advanced is that we try to let the machines discover things are, uh, themselves. And there's, uh, uh, there's, there's two things. The most extreme example here is unsupervised learning. So basically without any or very limited human input, we let the machine uh, find out what patterns are in the text. Um, the other uh, way of going about this is to do supervised learning where we use humans to train algorithms. So you, and it's literally training, right? You give them, a, you provide the machine or the algorithm with a test set uh, you kind of show the algorithm what you would do as a human, and then you try to let the algorithm figure out the patterns, why the human is making those decisions, and, and then also let the algorithm uh, be applied to situations that were not in the initial uh, training set. And then you can say, well, this is, this is uh, maybe just to automate the boring stuff. Well, the reality is these, these unsupervised or supervised uh, machine learning approaches it can yield really interesting results. So here you see an image of the, of the AI therapist, uh, which was claimed to, at least in specific cases, to do a better job than, than human therapists uh, would. So one of these instances is PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, of which um, a lot of people who are in the army and army officers um, uh, suffer from after they come back from a mission. Uh, and one of the reasons why this virtual therapist was actually successful was that it turns out that people are more likely to open up and feel less embarrassed if they know there's a machine in front of them uh, rather than a, a real human. So this is one of the cases where, where this virtual therapist actually was, uh, was quite successful. And then you can, you can ask yourself like, how can a therapist be successful? Isn't that like super artificial? What can that, that virtual therapist actually do? Well, it can do a lot. So one of the things is that it can really um, uh, sense what, what is going on with people and um, sense emotions and respond to those emotions. So imagine that you have um, a training set of, of hundreds or thousands or even hundreds of thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of people where you can actually read their emotions and, and provide feedback. Uh, and also that you have a, a training set where you know how to respond in, in certain cases. So you collect the best practices of human um, of human therapists and you try to teach an AI to respond to a certain expression that somebody has or a certain response that somebody gives, whether it's, or it's a physical a facial response or whether it's a verbal response or maybe a combination. Uh, if, if you just have enough training data, it might be that this, this AI can actually figure out what the best way is to respond to somebody. So it's not just the odd, like automating the boring stuff, it's also automating like the things that we always thought that only humans can do. So, so um, an example in the legal field is prediction. Like this is a very hot topic. We try to predict outcomes uh, of cases because it wouldn't that be great if we would be able to predict the outcomes of cases, then we wouldn't have to go to court anymore uh, and we could just let this uh, be done by a machine. Uh, there's lots of studies. I, I copied a few here. Uh, but there's many more in various legal systems on, on different types of automation. Here you see US Supreme Court, uh, here constitutional law. There's, there's even studies on, uh, on the connection between emotions and the outcomes of, uh, of cases. So there's, that sounds really nice and really fancy. But we have to keep in mind that when we analyze court decisions, we're basically trying to predict the past because these court decisions have already happened. So what you're trying to do is predict cases that, that based on cases that have already happened. Uh, and there's a big step from going from there to predicting cases that actual clients or citizens would, would bring because they would always formulate things differently than how judges lay things down in their decisions. Okay, so how does this go, this prediction model? 
This is like commonly and, and essentially how it goes. So first you select the number of texts. You, so you divide these texts into like basically groups. You have training data and then you have uh, test data. So in the training data, you have outcomes and then you have facts, for example, and you try to, to teach the machine to kind of uh, uh, test correlations between the facts and those outcomes, right? So if this, the facts are in a, formulated in a certain way, is that associated with a certain outcome, for example, granting or not granting the complaint? Then you train the algorithm and then uh, you, you basically have the algorithm and then you apply the algorithm to the test data. The test data where are the data where you leave out the outcomes and you let the machine predict the outcomes and then you can compare the outcomes that the machine predicts to the outcomes uh, that are um, in, your, in your data actually. So for example, you use the, the, the training data to train those al algorithms to predict the outcomes, violations or non-violations, uh, complaints are, that are granted that are not granted. Um, okay, so again, like you, you apply the, the trained model to the, to the test data, which leaves out certain data so you can actually make predictions and not, not cheat. So what is then a, a practically relevant prediction? So actually a practically relevant prediction would be that you use facts drafted prior to the decision because that would prevent so-called motivated reasoning, right? So there is empirical research uh, that shows that when judges come to their decision, uh, they might actually be very uh, hesitant uh, and, and divided. Maybe they're 60% convinced of um, determining an outcome in a certain way, granting the complaint, for example. But then there's also 40% doubt with respect to that. If you read how judges motivate their decision, it often looks like it's like 90-10. Like they're super convinced about the outcomes of their decisions. So there is a part of motivated uh, reasoning where you try to um, uh, you try to justify, you try to motivate your decision uh, based on the decision that you're going to uh, going to make. So ideally, you would want to kind of use not not the facts from the decision itself, but the facts before the decision making process begins. So there are researchers who who've tried to do that or are trying to do that. Uh, I, I mentioned the example here of the European Court of Human Rights that also has, uh, uh, publishes communicated cases at the very early stage of the beginning of the case. Uh, so without there's, that there's any judges involved who are already reasoning about the outcomes. And, and those facts, those communicated cases could then serve as, uh, as input to make like true, truer predictions. But then again, like that, and that's kind of like next level and AI hasn't gotten that far yet where you actually have uh, like facts drafted by lawyers uh, or even by citizens. And then based on the facts drafted by the lawyers, citizens or others, uh, you would be able to uh, predict the outcomes of the cases. Uh, that is super hard. And I'll explain why that uh, in a minute, why that is. So, so that's one thing. The other thing is that we're just calculating correlations. And I have a few funny examples of, um, of a, a person who basically collected a lot of data points, millions of data points and uh, 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 hundreds or, or thousands of variables. And you just throw everything in a bin, you, you start calculating correlations. And then the interesting thing is that you will find correlations uh, of, uh, of seemingly random, uh, random things. So here you see a very high correlation point uh, 67 uh, between the number of people drowned uh, by falling into a pool and the number of films that Nicolas Cage appears in. Uh, an even higher, almost perfect correlation you see here between the, the, the cheese consumption and then also the number of people who died by becoming uh, tangled in their bed sheets. And also a very high correlation you see between the age of Miss America and the uh, murders by steam, hot vapors and, and hot objects. And you can say, well, what, what's, uh, you know, this is just random. Somebody threw in random things together. Uh, and I think that's true, right? So I don't think there's a causal relationship. It's not that because of the age of Miss America increases that the number of murders actually increases. Um, so, but if you look at these data, in hindsight, you could actually could come up with some uh, explanations here. Right, so here you could say, well, of course, like it's it's reasonable to understand that you know if the age of Miss America goes up, then the number of murders goes up, goes up, because people don't want to see old Miss Americas; they want to see young Miss Americas. And so, if that that age goes up, then people get more aggressive because they get dissatisfied and maybe they start murdering people. 
Um, same thing for the, the per capita cheese consumption and people dying because they get tangled in the bed sheets. The per capita cheese consumption means if you eat more cheese, you probably become a little bit bigger and then you get tangled up in your bed sheets and maybe you're also more likely to die because of that. Same thing for number of people drowning into falling into a pool and number of uh, films that Nicolas Cage appears in. Nicolas Cage appears in action movies. Uh, what, what happens if you watch an action movie? You get the adrenaline going. And if you have more adrenaline in your, in your body, then it's also more likely that you're going to uh, show risky behavior. And maybe that explains why uh, more people drown by uh, falling into a, into a pool. Of course, for all these examples, uh, this is still very far-fetched. It's, it's not credible. I'm, I'm not proposing any serious uh, effects or explanations here, but it's also not completely otherworldly, right? So if we take, take correlations that might seem more credible, it's actually, yeah, it actually we run into the risk that we take a correlation for a causal relationship. So also with respect to prediction. So, so let me show this. So this is from, uh, from a study, which is uh, quoted here. I like to study, uh, study a lot, but look at, these, uh, look at these terms. So the terms under the blue bars kind of indicate a positive uh, relationship with a violation. So if those terms appear, it, it becomes more likely that you'll also find a violation in that text. And the red bars basically indicate words or terms that make it less likely that you'll find a, a, a violation. A ver um, violation. So if you look at these terms, they, they don't really make sense from a, from a substantive perspective, right? So the, the term in case no, or prosecutor office of, or the military prosecutor, is that really a good substantive indicator of the, the likelihood of a violation being found uh, going up? Uh, what's probably going on here is that these words are, are, are either random, uh, so they're basically correlations and outcomes of correlations, or it could be that these words are proxies for something else. So for example, the term, the military prosecutor, it could be that some countries are more likely to find a vi violation per se, because they're more involved in, uh, in military activities that will earlier constitute a violation. So if that's the case, then maybe those words are actually proxies for something else in the, in the data. Um, so yeah, when we're talking about machine learning for predictions, this is the state of the art where there's a lot of um, uh, insights going on as to what correlates to the outcomes, but we're not that far yet that we actually know what the causal mechanism uh, is here. Um, and, and going uh, beyond that or building on that, it's also important to recognize that machines are, are also rather dumb. They're not that smart. You need a lot of training data. Uh, to make a machine understand what's going on. So let me give you an example. This is an example from the, the DSM directive, Digital Single Market Directive is gonna be transposed or will have to be transposed by uh, summer 2021. And this is one of the articles. And look at how difficult it already is for a machine to recognize what's going on here. So here you see article 15 of the directive. Um, you will have to teach a machine that, that the term article and, and 15 refers to a certain article. Uh, it states, it also states this directive. So you have to like look within that directive, which is very easy for humans to do, but a computer has no clue, right? So you have to train the computer to make it understand that the term this directive means that you have to look within the same directive. And that in combination with article 15, it means that it means that you have to look for article 15 in that same uh, directive. Then when you go to article 15 on the bottom of your screen, you see a lot of things going on, like member states shall provide publishers of press publications uh, established in a member state and so on and so on. And then you also see another reference there, right? Article two and article three of, of another directive. So you have to make the machine understand what that means and then go fetch the relevant information in another directive. There's more going on here. Right? Member states shall uh, provide for an exception to the rights, uh, but what is an exception and, and which rights? Well, one of the examples here is Article 15 of this directive, but there's also other examples, Article 7, uh, but then of a different directive, a directive from 1996, and then Article 5 as well. And here you have to teach the machine that both Article 5 and Article 7 uh, refer to the same directive, but that that's a different directive than uh, uh, 
the one mentioned after that, and also different directive than the one we already uh, discussed. Um, this, why is this very hard for a machine? Because it doesn't understand, uh, understand the connections here. You have to teach the machine to, un to make it understand how we as humans see all these connections. So basically the best example is compare it to training a, like a, a one-year-old baby to understand this. It's, it's gonna take a long time for that, for that baby to, to pick that up, right? It has to mature, the brain has to grow. And at some point it will start picking up these connections. Well, the same applies uh, uh, to machines um, with that difference that machines take a lot of more training data in order to understand these patterns. Yeah, maybe another another example here. So in compliance with paragraph one, so you need to teach a machine what it means that you need to be in compliance. What that what does that mean in compliance with? And what is paragraph one? What does that refer to? Also have to teach a machine. And also interestingly, often in legal text we refer to other legal texts or other parts in legal text, not only by an explicit reference to another article, but also very implicit sometimes. So for example, here we have the phrase. Um, apply measures to ensure the security and integrity of the networks and the databases. Uh, what, what does that mean? And can we find some other information elsewhere that, that gives us uh, more of an idea of what this is about? Well, in this directive, you can actually find more information. For example, in recital 16, which kind of has and, and uses the same phrase. But then also in recital 18, which also uses a similar phrase, but gives you a lot of less information. So what a machine is good at is kind of looking for similar phrasings, but it's really bad at, at understanding how to interpret that and how to connect those things and, and how to reason with that. That's, that reasoning is really a skill that, that humans uh, are, are much better at than, um, than machines, unless you have sufficient tra training data, of course. Okay, so this is like, I guess the bad news or the limitations, uh, but the good news is, and, and the interesting part is that these algorithms are getting better and they're getting better and better. So for example, here we see an example of what is called uh, entity recognition or named entity recognition. Um, you see the different uh, colors in the text and these different colors uh, reflect uh, the different types of, of entities that we're detecting. So some of these colors represent uh, persons or locations or dates uh, uh, um, uh, or tools. So if you kind of are able to teach a machine to detect this automatically, it's going to take some time, but at some point the machine is going to be able to take take that over and do this for hundreds, thousands, millions of instances within seconds, minutes, or or, or hours. At least much and much faster than we as humans would be able to to do this. Uh, here you see a legal example of uh, I think it's a German uh, uh, code, it could be Austrian, but I think it's German. And what you see here is that references are recognized. And not only that there's a reference, but also what types of uh, reference, right? So you see that by uh, the denotation of uh, GS, VO, VS, VT, et cetera. Um, basically the machine here already is picking up what type of, um, of reference uh, we're, we're seeing here. Uh, and again, this is, this is taking off tremendously and the more information, the more data, the more training these algorithms will have. Uh, the better they will perform at, at automatically detecting these things in different languages. Also think about a, a contract, right? So contracts are typically uh, legal documents created by humans for humans. Um, but what if the, the machine and the algorithms can already start picking up interesting information that, that might be relevant, like maybe the parties or the dates or, or the schedule and the currency and even the title and do that for not only like this first page of, of 21 pages, but do it for a lot of pages. And now take a, a, a step further where the contract is actually, can be drafted by, by a machine because it's very standardized, right? If every contract is gonna look kind of similar, the machine will be able to very quickly pick up like certain patterns in these, in these contracts. And once we start training these, uh, machines or algorithms in terms of what are good contracts or what are good uh, provisions and what are not so good provisions, uh, then the machine will actually be able to kind of like signal and, and flag which, which clauses in, uh, in the contracts can be problematic or should be in there or uh, are, are preferred. There. And there's actually companies that, that already are, uh, are doing this uh, and they claim that they can actually outperform legal experts in this, in this respect. 
Uh, and I guarantee you, the more these things become standardized and machine readable, the, the more this, these types of things will take on. Um, yeah, so as I said, like sometimes they can really outperform humans, uh, and there's lots of uh, lots of studies already. Uh, if you if you look for it online, you will find reviews uh, that actually provide you with, uh, with relevant information in that respect. I'll show you one example, which is uh, Claudette. It's developed by uh, uh, colleagues from uh, from other universities, uh, and what they do here is is basically it's a website. You can find it yourself if you look for Claudette online. If, uh, you can go to the website and, and try some some stuff out yourself. There, it's being trained on European legislation on unfair clauses. So you can basically copy uh, clauses, standard terms from uh, wherever you find them. You can put them in and then you click on submit. Uh, and then uh, Claudette or the machine, the algorithm will automatically try to detect potentially uh, problematic clauses. So I did that for three uh, clauses. Uh, the top one is from Rovio. The, the middle one is I think from uh, Dropbox and uh, the bottom one is from academia.eu. And you see here what, what it does. So you enter the, the clause, which is in bold, uh, and then you see highlighted in the color what the potential problem is here, right? So in the first example, you see that there might be a problem with limitation of liability. And the second clause that there might be unilateral termination. And then in the third clause, uh, there's a problem, possible problem with unilateral termination and unilateral change. Um, again, like these algorithms do not perform perfectly. In fact, they, they may still make a lot of, uh, a lot of mistakes. Um, but then again, this is also one of the first attempts to, to do it. So imagine that we have much more training data, much more experts instructing the machine what, what is possible, what should be possible, what shouldn't be possible. Uh, and, and you'll kind of figure out that these machines will work on only better over time. And then an, another topic. So this is also AI, but maybe in, not so much for prediction purposes or, or categorization, but it's for data sharing purposes. So how do we do, how do we use AI there? Well, I'll first start with explaining the, the problem to you. So the, the problem is that sharing data is often problematic because it's confidential and it's secure. Uh, so it contains confidential uh, information and it needs to be stored secure because if we don't store it secure, then with a hack or a breach, then uh, others can obtain that data. So we have uh, rules, the GDPR, the General Data Protection Regulation, uh, on the EU level, uh, that kind of prevents you from, uh, from, from using that uh, the data and sharing that data uh, only in, in specific, uh, specific circumstances you're allowed to do that. So the solution is basically to try to still learn from the data, but then learn from the data without sharing. And there, two techniques come to mind, so multi-party computation, or MPC, and federated learning, which I'll, I'll call FL. So I'll explain a bit to you what, what, uh, uh, what that means and how that works. So this is an example of multi-party computation. What you see on the right with the person in the middle is that you, uh, you basically send your data to that uh, trusted third party. And if that trusted third party can indeed be trusted and can, uh, can securely store the data, then that's an ideal situation. Nothing happens, uh, uh, no breaches, uh, no problem with the, the data that you're sharing. Uh, obviously there are problems because maybe that trusted third party is not to be trusted. Uh, because it's going to sell the data or transfer the data to others without your permission or even your knowledge. Uh, maybe it's, uh, it, it is a trusted third party, but it gets hacked so others uh, can, can have access to the data. So another way of going about this is to um, uh, um, introduce uh, so-called decentralized systems. What I just talked about is a centralized system. But here it's important for you to keep in mind that we're talking about now a decentralized system. And that's kind of explained and, and visualized on the left side of your screen. So there's no third party anymore. Basically, you're sharing your data with everybody else, but in two, uh, with two important characteristics. One is that you encrypt all the data so that when your data travels to the other person that not, nobody can, can, when they intercept it, can actually read what's going on. And, and then also you, you not send, do not send the complete data, but you only uh, send like pieces of the data, so so-called uh, shared uh, secrets, and only if you have the key to the like the encryption key, and only if you have access to basically all of all of the uh, the, the shared data that is uh, that's being sent around, then uh, the shared secrets, then only then you can have a uh, basically see what the data is about. Um, 
So the example that's often used for this is, uh, is the so-called millionaires, uh, millionaires problem, or an even simpler problem is you're often interested in uh, whether you earn more or less compared to others. But you don't want to give up your salary. Yeah? If somebody asks you what's your salary, you're usually inclined, or most people are inclined to say, I'm, I'm not willing to give that up. That's, that's my information. That's personal. But if you're interested in knowing whether you earn less or more than others, then what about if everybody sends their, their salary into this, this uh, space where automatically the average is calculated? And the only thing you can see and the only thing you can get back as a user is that average salary so you can see what your salary is compared to the, to the average. Uh, everything is stored uh, securely and, uh, and, the, and the data is not shared with, uh, with others, at least not in a way that, that is meaningful to them. So that's an example of multi party computation. Um, an example of federated learning is what, what colleagues at BIS actually have been working on. Imagine there's hospital data of you across uh, five hospitals uh, and you want to learn from that data, from your patient data, but also from other patient data. Uh, but you don't want to share that, that personal information, right? Similar to the, the trusted third party. You won't, don't want to pull it out of the database and, and dump it somewhere uh, and hope that it, it will, will remain safe. So instead of going like moving the data to the algorithm, you send the algorithm to the data. So then that's exactly what happens here. You send algorithms to these respective hospitals where the algorithms make these calculations. And then the only thing they bring back is the aggregated uh, results or the results of the, of the algorithms. And you, then you combine it, you do a new calculation. And with a click on the button, the only thing you see as a, as a researcher is what the outcome is to the question that you're interested in. For example, the likelihood of, 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 uh, of getting cancer given certain characteristics that you have. So what it allows you to do, same as uh, multi-party computation, is that without seeing a single row of data, it allows you to, um, uh, to make calculations and to come up with, uh, with a result without um, a, the problem of sharing personal data here. All right, and then a, a last example of, of what you can do with, uh, with AI, and this is something we're also, uh, that I'm wor working on in my, in my Master Law and Tech Lab, uh, my colleagues there mostly, is, is finding precedence or landmark cases by using network analysis. So most of you probably don't know what network analysis is. Uh, so, so this is an example of social network analysis uh, where you can use Twitter or Facebook data to kind of see who interacts with who and who communicates with who. And if you do that for a sufficiently large group, then at some point you're gonna see patterns of, of people who are more popular and therefore also more central in the, in the network compared to others. Um, so here you see like some people in the middle, they, they communicate with a lot of people directly or indirectly, that is through others. And, and then you see also some people on the, on the side of the screen who hardly communicate with, uh, with anybody uh, because they don't know anybody or maybe they're not that active or there can be many reasons for that. Um, but this concept of, of measuring popularity, you can also use that for, for court decisions. And that's basically what we've been doing. So this is the, the way how we as lawyers the legal scholars normally operate. We read, we think very hard, and then we come up with intelligent uh, outcomes. And that's fine. We've been doing that for, for hundreds and thousands of years, and we definitely should not give that up. But we could use, make more use of the computational power and possibilities that are out there. Because the, basically the only um, uh, transformation that we have gone through is that instead of that we're, we're reading things from the books, we're now reading things from the screens. We can do a lot more. So if you uh, apply this, this network analysis methods and techniques to court decisions, then, then this is what you can do. So this is an example of employer's liability. The Dutch Supreme Court cases are, are plotted here. Uh, the nodes, so the, the dots are, uh, are the decisions and the lines or edges between the decisions are the, the citations, right? So if you have one court decision citing another court decision and you do that for a large number of court decisions, then at, least at, at some point you're gonna see patterns between those court decisions. And you're gonna see that some court decisions are cited more frequently than others. And if you plot that for a lot of these decisions, then you get these kind of, kind of graphs. And what is very interesting is that once you do that, these uh, network analysis uh, metrics and, and measures and possibilities, they allow you to kind of identify subtopics in the network. And by identifying these uh, sub-networks uh, in the and communities in the networks, it allows you to kind of 
delve into what this network of, in this case, employer liability is about. So these networks, what you see is there's, there's a, a cluster on causality, there's a cluster on the duty of care, there's a cluster of the statute of limitations, there's a cluster on when you uh, uh, get a traffic accident while you're performing uh, uh, work, for example, taxi drivers, uh, and there's, a, there's other things as well that you, you can connect here. So what I'm trying to, to say and, and show here is that these network analysis metrics and, and, and techniques, they allow you to kind of automatically identify already subtopics. And from validation studies that I've conducted uh, with, with colleagues and also students even, it turns out that, that often these, um, these techniques perform equally as good or sometimes even better as, uh, as what you would read in the, in the literature and in the textbooks. It also offers other possibilities. So for example, you can uh, say like, okay, give me the decisions that, that, that are kind of providing an overview of the field. When do, good, uh, when do decisions provide a good overview of the field? Well, when they cite other relevant decisions. So there's metrics that you can use to, to do that. So here the metric is that, that's chosen is out degree, the number of outgoing citations. And then you basically can rank the decisions, even depending on the uh, the cluster that you selected or for each cluster. So you, you can see per cluster, what are the relevant decisions. You can also rank them based on, on in-degree incoming citations. Uh, so this is the example I already uh, talked about. Like if you, if a lot of people communicate with you, you're probably uh, are pretty popular um, if, or important. If a lot of court decisions are citing another court decision, then it might be an indication that that court decision is also relevant. Uh, and also, again, there's, there's different metrics because you know, a, a decision from 1970 is more likely to get cited than a decision from 2010. So you can correct for that by giving more weight to more recent decisions, which is done by the metric of, of relative integrity. So it allows you to basically um, yeah, uh, uh, make clusters and then per cluster or for the whole network, kind of rank these, uh, these decisions. I'll show some examples here. So this technique is not entirely new. Actually, it's, it's being applied by, uh, by, by quite some, uh, some folks now, uh, I include some, some examples here. So this is network analysis on US Supreme Court decisions. Uh, there's been network analysis studies on European Court of Human Rights, uh, on the Court of Justice of the European Union, uh, on Dutch law, on uh, Italian constitutional law, uh, on, on the French legal system of the legal codes. So this is not case law, but these are legal codes where there's references to other parts of the code uh, and that all, you also see in, uh, in Germany. Okay, going to the conclusions. So what are, what are the takeaways here? So I think I have, I have a few. Uh, first takeaway is that I don't think there's an, an existential threat here. Yes, computers can outperform humans, uh, but it doesn't mean that we're going to be replacing humans. Uh, we will need humans for certain tasks. Uh, at the minimum, we will need the humans to train machines uh, because the machines need to learn how to, how to think or how to reason or how to make certain connections. So that means that lawyers, judges will, will not be replaced or very unlikely to be replaced. However, some of their activities will be replaced. Think about, again, the, the virtual therapist um, uh, where you could say like, yeah, like there the virtual therapist is actually going to um, replace the, the normal therapist, at least for a certain subset of patients uh, where it actually works better. Does it mean the human is completely eliminated? No, because we need humans still to, uh, to validate or to, um, uh, to evaluate these bots or these, uh, these AI therapists um, and to improve them. So also important is like we, what we see in, in AI and law is that a lot of this human expertise can be and is transferred to these uh, machines. So we can formalize actually a lot of structures and, and processes that, that are going on. I'll explain a little bit more about that in a bit. Um, we can use and, and should use and, and are using humans to train uh, algorithms. Uh, and sometimes uh, at some point, these machines can actually learn independently from the input. From, from humans that we give. And that's an example of unsupervised learning. And of course, there's combinations where you uh, first uh, have a supervised model that, that turns into an unsupervised model or vice versa, or you use a combination of the, of the both of the two. 
Okay, so, so what can we then concretely use AI for? Uh, for detecting patterns, uh, but watch out here, the difference between correlation and causality. You might find correlations that are not causal, uh, so be aware of that. Uh, If-then statements, uh, very easy to, uh, to pick up by, uh, by machines. Uh, they outperform humans once instructed well. Classification, so if you have, for example, files that consist of, of hundreds or thousands or, or millions of pages, uh, computers are very good at uh, automatically classifying these documents uh, into meaningful uh, topics or subjects. Um, decision trees. So if you encounter a decision tree, and this is kind of how we train our law students. We, we provide them with a structure, sort of a decision tree, and then let them reason with that decision tree. If you have such a de decision tree, um, you can automate that, or at least formalize it in a way uh, so that people can uh, can ask questions or reason with that. And, and the legal bots that I introduced are, are good examples of that. And also very important, high volumes. So you need high volumes, uh, a lot of training data in order to, uh, uh, to do meaningful things. So examples, uh, review and e-discovery. Again, like if you have uh, big files, uh, e-discovery can help you with uh, categorizing those, uh, those files into meaningful categories. Uh, prediction uh, of, of legislation. If there's upcoming legislation, there's now models and, and techniques that kind of show, at least in the US, uh, whether it will affect your company and whether it's gonna affect your company negatively or, or positively. Um, other analysis of, of regulation um, uh, can be laws, can be uh, uh, court decisions or anything in between. Contracts already mentioned, and then indeed predictions. Uh, outcomes is still a little bit difficult as I, as I explained, but semantic similarity, looking for a similar text that, that looks similar textually uh, or for question answering systems, uh, that's uh, yeah, that's that's something where uh, where AI is in law is really taking off. Okay, then what should you not expect from AI? I would say anomalies. Uh, so AI can detect patterns. It it really has difficulties finding anomalies, and also very importantly, if there's no data or if there's few training data, then that's also difficult for for AI to pick up. Uh, although I must say that there's already uh, techniques uh, that are being uh, tested and tried and, and some actually pretty successfully. Um, that's called like zero shot learning or few shot learning where you try to instruct an AI based on very limited examples. And with that, uh, I think we have arrived at the um, question part. So Aus, are there uh, uh, any questions? Thank you very much, uh, Professor Van Dijk. Uh, yes, of course, there are uh, several questions. Uh, uh, and I will, uh, before I start with those questions, I would like to ask you to qualify, to clarify one part. You have mentioned in your, uh, in your presentation, um, a machine readable text. Can you please just uh, elaborate more about the meaning of machine readable text and how can we um, like how can we make our contracts machine readable yeah so that's a good good question so let me start with human readable text if we as humans read text we understand what the meaning like we understand the concept of a word and the concept of word order and we also understand and that's what we get taught basically in elementary school uh, already is, is how these words connect and how, what, how the meaning of these words can also depend on the context. So the combination of other words, the sentences, uh, or even the setting in which these words are used. Um, if you depart from the, the idea that a machine knows nothing and you have to teach the machine from scratch what, what all of this means, then you start to understand what is a when things become machine readable. So just providing things to machines, like for example, the word questions that's on the screen now, a machine won't understand anything. It doesn't, it won't even understand what, what is a letter and that, that the, the letter U has, uh, that follows the letter Q has actual meaning. So you have to basically, the structure that you teach to humans uh, already to, to children in elementary school, that's something you need to teach machines uh, um, to do. And once you do that, then things become machine interpretable. So if you arrange for a framework that allows machines to, to pick up on those things, um, where they can actually recognize the, the symbols, for example, or the words, and you allow for an infrastructure or the, 
machine can pick up the meaning of, of those words, then things become a machine interpretable because a machine now just sees pixels. It just sees like that something is a little bit more dark than, 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 uh, than the surroundings, which is white. Uh, and even for that, the machine needs to, needs to understand that. So at that very basic level, um, you need to teach a machine how to, how to do that. And of course, nowadays we have that because it's automatically programmed in, in all our hardware and all the computers, the laptops, the desktops, and the phones that we have. Um, so we can, we can build on that. But that's the first step for a machine, like, okay, like how do we go from pixels to meaningful objects and, and how, what do these meaningful objects mean and, and how can we make sense of that? Thank you, this is uh, clear. Um, actually, I have a question here from uh, Hussam Zakaria. Uh, he's asking, um, so let's say that uh, we, like in general, um, if, if you have lots of databases and lots of data sets, what, determine, what determines actually how successful you are in analyzing those data is actually how well uh, fine-tuned your, your algorithm. So how you are able to, to manage, um, like to design an algorithm which can read uh, uh, into this data and uh, get results. Now, if, if, I, if, if we think in this way that, for example, now you, you showed us um, the, the, how, how we can know through, through algorithms, through data that uh, which judge to choose in order to win this case or, or uh, what kind of cases, main cases that uh, through network analysis are the, 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 the more heavy cases in this, in this field. So, um, and then maybe later on we will know um, how to argue in front of a court in order to win certain cases. So, um, do you think that in the future there will be um, like the law firms will be uh, a way of like balance or, or, or evaluated based on uh, not how qualified their lawyers are, but how fine tuned or how well designed their algorithms are. Yeah, so excellent question. So I'll start with the latter. Uh, there's already a duty to Google that uh, has appeared in court cases where a law firm was uh, accused of, of not doing their job properly because they didn't uh, uh, they didn't use Google and I think that's that will become indeed more and more of a practice I don't know like my predictions are also not that uh, not that great I would say um, but um, I guess the, the general sense that I could give is that um, these developments go rather slow uh, from if you look at the, the short term so if you expect a lot within the next two years it, you're probably going to be disappointed but probably in the next 10 years, when you look back, you're going to say like, wow, like these are like huge uh, strides and advancements. And I think that also applies here. Uh, I don't know where we're going to be in two years or in 10 years, uh, but I do know we're going to have made uh, substantial strides in, in that respect. So, so yeah, I do think that these tools are going to increase, that, uh, that practice is going to use it. Uh, and we'll have to use it. And uh, I think those will eventually also result in, in certain standards. I mean, imagine now a lawyer who, who doesn't use any electronic system and just goes by, by their cards in, in their boxes that they've been collecting uh, in the 1970s. That's probably not gonna fly anymore. And if a judge writes down a decision in, in that way, uh, like in a very old school way, like only citing a few cases, whereas he or she's missing a lot of other cases because he, he or she's not using like the up-to-date uh, uh, methods that we nowadays use. Uh, it's probably going to be low quality outcomes and, and it's not going to uh, hold, hold up anymore, I would think. So, so yeah, I definitely think the field will progress to the extent that, uh, that there will be expectations, maybe even for, from job seekers where students who get educated with these techniques will also want to work for firms that also use that techniques, uh, those techniques and do not or might not at some point want to work for firms that, that, uh, that, that haven't made that, uh, those technological steps. So that with respect to the, like how I think like the, the, the market will, will develop. Then the first question about data sharing. Um, yeah, I think the most important part for data sharing is that you have proper data. 
Uh, and that's like the garbage in, uh, garbage out principle. If, you, if the data that you throw in is, is bad, uh, then the outcome will be bad, regardless of whether you're gonna uh, uh, throw in a lot of data and combine your data with, with others. That being said, you can also update the quality of your data by comparing it to other data sources. Uh, and there you can actually use a multi-party computation or federated learning to, um, uh, to do that because it allows you to share data or learn from data without actually sharing it, right? So a lot of organizations don't want to give up on, on what they have, uh, and, and I, I understand that. Um, so what about organizing something where you can actually validate your data against the, the data that, uh, that others have and might be more reliable, but it, without actually anybody giving up any of that, uh, of that data. So data quality is very important, I would say. Um, and then, uh, yeah, I would, I would also think the, the, it starts with the questions that you, that you ask. So you have to have good questions because if you have no question and you just analyze data and the hope that something will come out, then again, you'll, like, you'll also run into the risk that you're gonna find correlations and maybe not causal uh, relationships. Uh, and then I think the third aspect is, that's also very important is when you start learning from data without sharing it in an MPC or federated learning type of way, what is really important is that you have fair data sets. So, and not fair in terms of legal fair, of course, like we also need to adhere to legal standards of fairness, but I'm mostly talking about a fair in terms of a findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. So what normally organizations do when, to, when they want to share data is to, they pull out the data from their data set, uh, another organization does the same, and then they found out, find out that these data are not really compatible. So in, instead of, trying to create this big data warehouse that can uh, accommodate every type of data, it might make, might, might make much more sense to make these data stations or, or data sets fair so that somebody can communicate with that and just pick up the data in the way that you want it to be picked up. And you do that for different organizations and that allows you to then learn uh, from the data across, uh, across data sets. To explain a little bit more in detail, so imagine you have um, you're ordering something in the restaurant, uh, but there's no, no menu card or there's no waiter uh, there. Uh, you need a menu card. And that's what I mean with uh, making the data fair. Because if you, as a, as a customer, if you select, uh, um, if you select a, 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 a burger or a steak or something, then with that instruction, the chef cook actually knows what to prepare for you. Right? But, if, but if that menu card is not there and you're just summing up ingredients, then the chef cook doesn't know what to do. Or if the chef cook has uh, ingredients uh, laying around, but, but yeah, doesn't know what to do with it because there's no good instruction, um, because there's no menu card, or maybe the waiter is lacking uh, and is not there, then it becomes a little bit more difficult. And the same thing you want to do when you want to share data. You want to make sure that, that there's a waiter somewhere and that there's a good menu card so that the data station can actually provide you with the data and, and give the waiter the data that, that you're looking for. And then if you do that for the different data sets in, in, in a way so that it accommodates the individual data sets and the, the difference between the data sets, then, uh, then you would have a good, good infrastructure. Uh, so it's a data quality, asking good questions and make sure you, uh, you have good fair data stations. Yeah, thank you. Uh, this is uh, this is clear, and I have I will take one last question, and it's from uh, Ahmad Shaheen. Um, actually, I uh, he's he's asking that. Um, so let's say that all of the law firms start to implement a, a artificial intelligence in their in their uh, like day to day life. And then, um, like we know for a fact that most of those law firms make um, a profit through uh, something called billable hours and how many hours they work for their clients. Uh, now with AI, I am decreasing the number of hours that I spend usually, and then I am like uh, as a result decreasing the number of uh, like the profit that i make so how do you think they those law firms if they are going to use such a technology how do you think that they are going to compensate uh, their profit from it yeah so a few a few answers here one is uh, i guess the true answer is i don't know 
Um, and the second answer is, is there a problem here? Um, and the third answer would be, uh, when we look at the technology that I showed in the beginning of the video assisted referee, um, you can also think of maybe some of the tasks will be replaced or be made much more efficient. Um, but then again, you'll, you'll have time to do other things that are maybe like equally meaningful or more meaningful that the customer is willing to, to pay for. Um, so yeah, I, I really don't know in which direction it, it would head into. Uh, I would think we'll, we'll get different types of lawyers uh, who are doing different activities, but not necessarily um, uh, yeah, less than, than what's going on um, at the moment. So that being said, there, there's another development, of course, and that's the market, right? If you, if you indeed have the billable hours and the, as a law firm, you, 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 know, you bill your clients based on the number of hours that you put into, into things, you can keep doing that and you can keep drafting contracts, for example, uh, at, at the rate of between 150 and 300 euros an hour, uh, which is fine. Um, but, but now imagine that there's companies and, and these companies are already there who can offer you standardized contracts, uh, also reviewed by specialists, but in a standardized way. And you can basically like click the elements that you wanna have in your contract. And instead of having to pay 150 or 200 euros an hour, now all of a sudden you can just order it in a web shop for and compose it yourself for 60 euros. Uh, maybe it's not as perfect as you would want it to have it with the with the lawyer, um, but but then again, you know, like what do you want to pay? Do you want to pay 800 euros for maybe like a little bit better contract, or do you want to be paying 60 euros for a, a contract that's also perfectly fine? So I think these these market developments um, they will determine ultimately what's. Uh, how the, 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 the business and the firms will, uh, will change in terms of their activities, what they do and, and how they do it. Uh, so again, coming back to the, the first slides, you can try to fight it or try to stop it or prevent it. But, and, and that I'm pretty sure about, the market will be stronger than, than that. And, and the development of the technology will also be stronger than that. So I think it's just better to, to be proactive, to think about what the possibilities are uh, so that you can reshape your practice so that it's uh, future proof. Well, uh, thank you so much, uh, Professor Van Dijk. With that, I uh, we we like we are on time, kind of. We are a little bit uh, more over the time. There are many other questions, but um, I'm not able to take them all. Uh, we will try to uh, reply to you uh, through email. And if you have other questions, please uh, uh, send, uh, send it to us through, uh, to our emails. Also, I would like to add one extra point. If your organization is interested in trainings in legal AI or interested in going smart by using one of the AI applications, please contact Brightlands Institute for Smart Society. And with that, I would like to thank you for your time and participation and thank Professor Van Dijk for this informative presentation. Yeah, thanks. It was uh, fun doing and was fun interacting with everybody. So thank you for, uh, for joining. Bye, everybody. Have a nice uh, evening.